Good afternoon, viewers. This afternoon, we have a talk on India at 75. The talk is going to be delivered by the renowned economist, Professor Yogendra Alad. Let me say a few words about Professor Alad, while most of us who would be hearing him this afternoon would have known him for many years. Professor Alad did his early education at the University of Rajasthan, and his higher education, his doctoral and postdoctoral work in the University of Pennsylvania in USA. On return, he, besides teaching in Pennsylvania, he taught in the University of Rajasthan, the University of Jodhpur, at the Indian Institute of Management in Calcutta. And after his initial stint in the academia, he joined the Planning Commission. Uh, in the Planning Commission, Professor Alag had a phenomenal tenure of nearly two decades. And the work that he did here uh, is really seminal because while his essential responsibility was to draw up the policy frame of what would make India self-reliant in the realm of food and energy and sustainable rural development, he had spent a great deal of research time in establishing what is called the official poverty line, which was earlier drawn up in the 1960s, but didn't have a proper founding. The official poverty line that Professor Alag associated with has been known to most of us as the Alag property, a poverty line. This has not been erased, it's been built upon by successive uh, economists and committees and task forces, the Lakrawala group, the Tandulkar group, and so on. But uh, Professor Alag's founding work remains intact. His other associations have been with the Institute of Rural Management in Anand, with the Sardar Patel Institute of Economic and Social Research, of which he remains uh, Emeritus Chairman, and uh, with many other institutions uh, where he was invited to speak, invited to teach. He had been Chancellor of the Central University of Gujarat, a Vice Chancellor of the Central University of Jawaharlal Nehru University, and a Chair Professor in Punjab University. Professor Alag's work, since I am his virtually his contemporary, has been known far and wide, especially in the arena of agriculture policy, rural development, and so on. He is one of the very few, perhaps the only academic I have known in my own long career, who is extremely versatile. He's as at home running a university, central or state, managing a large institution of research and policy building, as working in the government. He was nominated to the Rajya Sabha and was there from 96 to 2001. During the course of this period, he was a cabinet minister in charge of planning, program implementation, and power. A part of this period when he was minister, uh, he served in the cabinet of Mr. Gujarat. And I had the circumstance to work with Professor Alag while I was serving as the principal secretary to the prime minister. And I have seen Professor Alag at work. I remember a particular occasion, perhaps Professor Alag may not recall it. One of the ministers in the cabinet, but there were serious allegations against him of financial impropriety. And uh, I had suggested to the prime minister to request Professor Alag to hold inquiry into that, those allegations. 
it is not a normal it's not a normal feature or a normal uh, approach for asking one minister to inquire into the conduct of another minister but uh, professor alag was holding the portfolio of science and technology he had a vast background and the prime minister had readily agreed and he approached professor alag and professor alag did a wonderful investigative job it's another matter that in our system the way we work the way we run our affairs those found guilty are not always dealt with professor alag has also had a long and distinguished career in the arena of international civil service he's been an expert and an advisor to fao ilo undp world bank adb and unesco and in all these arenas he has left his footprint behind in more recent times he's been writing a regular column in one of our national dailies which is read with great interest especially when he writes uh, with his enormous experience in the arena of agriculture the agitation which we have been of the farmers who have been agitating against the farm laws professor alag has written definitively about what needs to be done it's another matter that all his suggestions recommendations advice may not have been either fully understood or not fully heeded which is not a very good thing i would not uh, now speak more on professor alag and his vast experience in various arenas of work within the country and outside the country he is going to speak to us as i mentioned a little while ago on india and the threshold of celebrating 75th year of independence now when i am a refugee like professor alag when when we were displaced and we crossed over tens of millions became refugees and millions upon millions were massacred killed when we entered the new india there was a financial crisis financial emergency there was a food crisis there was no food to be distributed to the millions who had migrated and to the population which was already there there was extreme lawlessness serious disturbances and total lack of order the administrative structures administrative system had been badly vitiated disturbed by part of the workforce migrating to pakistan some people leaving their jobs and some who belong to united kingdom going back home but these challenges were taken on by the first the first national government first the interim government and then the first government under jawaharlal nehru when the constitution was adopted and it had battled with the various serious challenges of nation building i would now call upon professor alag to speak to us but i just mentioned briefly that in my own uh, fairly long experience of working uh, for the government from the time of the first prime minister to the present days of mr modi is a 14th prime minister i have worked through this period without a stop and i feel professor alag very disturbed that we have not been able to create the desired dent on the era of poverty and side by side we have had limited success in removing inequity unequal distribution of wealth if i may say so so having said this i request professor alag to please address us professor alag thank you sir i uh, am grateful to you for your uh, very insightful introduction to the subject in fact it's not that easy to uh, add on in a substantive manner 
do it, but I'll try my best. I'm also very grateful to you for all your kind words about me, which is more a reflection of our friendship rather than any merits that I may have. Uh, I'm going to speak largely on the trends and policies uh, that have been dominant in shaping of our country in the last five decades. Uh, I've been uh, lucky because about 19 years of the 35 years of work before I retired, I, I just retired not to draw a salary, but to really work with my love. Uh, I spent in Delhi. I think uh, uh, this experience. Um, the whole question of poverty and food sensitivity was very important to us in the uh, early 70s and the late 60s. Uh, poverty, there was a a number of rupees per month per person, which was attributed to a so-called eminent persons group, but that report was not really available. So when I joined the planning commission, I wanted some serious work done on it. Fortunately, uh, a young Indian revenue service, economic service officer, KL Datta, uh, joined us at that time. He wanted to join the planning commission. And I, of course, uh, said I'll speak with him before we get And he uh, was a statistician. And after he says, he just written a So I saved the embarrassment of using, and I'm using his book. Uh, he, in his preface, has said that uh, he came to the planning commission and I grilled him for three hours. Now, I think that was don't bring anybody, but I did have a long discussion with him. And I told him I wanted an analytical base, a scientific base to the question of poverty. I explained to him the work that was being done amongst other places in the Indian Statistical Institute and in the Sadar Patel Institute by Dr. Krishna, who was later on the chairman of our statistical commission. Uh, and Apul Sharma, who is a great distinguished economist. And I told him that, you know, now you get on the job. We set up a task force uh, under my chairmanship, which was set up by Shukma Chakravarti, who was in the planning commission. And uh, I won't get into the models because Dr. has done that. But we did uh, take into account the behavior of persons separately in rural and urban areas and defined uh, poverty both as a cutoff point as well as uh, very poor and uh, so that we could have policy directions of a meaningful kind. After those results became available because they were done in the kind of language, usually professors and statisticians I took that poverty line and I went on another transit road so that I tried to canvass it with uh, trade unions, with others, and got feedback from them. And that became what was called the Halak poverty line. Um, well, you know, by the uh, early 80s, I thought that poverty line had played its role. And needed to be jumped into history because, as uh, the Marxist historian Eric Hobsbawm has said, incidentally, he was a uh, regular at the IOC when he came to India. That societies tend to define minimum lines as history progresses. And I thought the Alak poverty line needed to be jumped. So I set up the Laknawala. Then I went back to my research job. Unfortunately, Saeed died. 
and what is called the Lakhrawala. And the only thing they did was they took the Alak Power T9 and they upgraded it for prices. Now, Tendulkar also did something of the same kind, only he took the, uh, the rural poverty line and applied it in both rural and urban areas. So, in a way, the Alak Poverty Line kept on being used, and I was very disturbed. I kept on saying this is wrong. We need to define it. Uh, nobody would do it. I would get a polite hearing, but it really wasn't done. And uh, working with the pension in Ahmedabad, which we have worked on this city, unfortunately, at present, uh, it is COVID grown, like uh, Delhi also. And uh, uh, I worked out that, you know, there is not, nobody will take less than a poverty line which has been established maybe even two decades ago. And more that is not to give. So that is why this poverty line keeps on while it should, in fact, be done. Simultaneously, we were working seriously on the problem of food self-reliance. When I joined the planning commission, uh, in those days, when we headed the prospective planning division, a very powerful group, uh, you were given an audience with the Prime Minister. Indira Gandhi called me and she looked at me and she said, Oh, you're very young. So I said, Chalo, way. And she was a very gracious lady. She saw me and, and uh, she said, No, no, sit down. You're very well spoken of. She said, Jobi karna karo, steel plant karo, but my people have to be fed. Lyndon Baines Johnson. The Hudson Institute had predicted that the only future for India, this was an American forecast, is how many million people will die. So she said, you must work out food self-reliance. We can't import grain the way it is. And we worked very hard. Unfortunately, the work, the earlier work on agriculture was based on data, which was actually from some yardsticks which came from Poland. I discovered that instead of that, we got district level data. Each one of the collectors of this country, people who had been trained by people like Borasa, they gave me that data. And based on that, we built what is called the agricultural sub model. And we said that if you do this, this, and this, you just spend money on minor irrigation, spend money on completing irrigation projects, spend money on canals, and so on, then we will produce 125 million tons of grain in 1978 79. And people said that this is the long haired boys of the Indian. And even the economic survey didn't agree with us. Saeb was the chief economic advisor. He was the same kind of position in the planning commission. And he tended to argue that we did not go beyond 122 million tons. In fact, our production was 120 million And in Washington, I was told that your target was 125. So I said, I come from Ahmedabad and we could do research. I came back to Ahmedabad uh, and I said that you can give us. And uh, then we really got at the real job of not just not depending on imports, the food aid from the Americans or whatever, but on actually for all around it growth. And in the 80s, uh, Rajiv Gandhi encouraged us to uh, plan on the basis of what was called agroclimatic planning, which is you take into account the land, the soil, the rivers, the groundwater, the climate, and you plan out the proper uh, cropping pattern, and then you give incentives for that. 
you can't dictate these things. And the person who helped us is uh, has registered for this webinar. Raj Paroda, who was uh, deputy director general of ICR. And while the Prime Minister was discussing on the racks with me, some scientific projects, he said, Sir, what about us? So I got him an audience with the Prime Minister. And the Prime Minister told him, What is it that you can do with this world class? And Paroda named six crops. And so the Prime Minister said, Give them the money, and if they do well, it's great for us and them. If not, sack. So that is the way it was going. on. you don't plan out agricultural research in the manner, but the resources were made available, and that then led to the kind of research and strategies, including completion of irrigation projects, field channels, taking the water to the farmer, covering the last which pushed our grain production to 140 and then 180 million tons. And I hope the chair is is around getting some time to talk about this. We also plan for energy self reliance. Coal production went up. We wanted hydro production to go up. Nuclear, we got out of this. Path where ultimately we will have a fast breeder reactor based on thorium. So that was the other path on which we were there, which is still relevant. And I hope that we pursue it. Um, many of these things had a global connection. Uh, the other book, which I have enjoyed reading right now, I've covered these things in. Like Dutta's book, use book, other other book. Uh, sorry for the interruption, sir. Sorry for the interruption, sir. Uh, Professor Ala requesting you, sir, please speak a little louder, sir. Actually, uh, we are not getting too much audio from your side, sir. So very okay. uh, Who uh, now I'm talking about India abroad and Nazareth. I've written a book on that, which I'm using rather than using my own material. And uh, he described how we joined the UNCTAD, uh, where he was there in uh, Lima, and uh, uh, all the negotiations. And there's an interesting story about UNCTAD, which is that uh, uh, there was uh, the, you know, before that, there was a special. I mean, we always insisted on a, on a, we didn't want the restrictions which some of these treaties bring to us because it later on went to the WTO. And Rajiv Gandhi uh, ultimately uh, the G7 negotiated and one by one the G77 gave up until finally there was only India and Brazil left. And uh, Rajiv Gandhi met the Brazilian president in a meeting in Paris, and he said, we gave up because uh, we were told that Brazil has given up and we didn't want to be the only country in the world. So the Brazilian president laughed and said, Mr. Prime Minister, I was told that India has given up, so we gave up. So that is the way it goes on in the world. But uh, we did accept restrictions of different kinds, but we did fight for Food security clause and uh, the special development clause for developing backward areas. And that we fought. Uh, the ministry that uh, Mora Saab referred to, Mora Sali Maran, was our commerce minister, and I used to uh, brief him on it. And I must say, he did a remarkable job in Goa. He was quite sick, but he went there and defended both these clauses, uh, naturally that was the right. But ultimately, um, we did persist. Suresh Prabhu 
also at least at the argentinian conference he stuck by that but unfortunately later on the started with problem they gave in and now we are willing to negotiate the other clauses to blow uh, to things so this is the other sequence uh, that won and uh, of course what happens is that two time planning was given up but as i was not nominated to the rajya sabha i was elected to the rajya sabha Respects, uh, but uh, we uh, we I could see the erosion in our ability to fight, uh, and gradually the role that we had created. Remember that with the Umtad, Indira Gandhi had at the Stockholm conference. since we are discussing poverty also made that famous speech that poverty is a pollutant is the greatest pollutant and now those kinds of stands we do and in the g77 um i think we probably lost something because we have a lot of lot of goodwill in latin america in africa and in east asia because of that I remember when I was in the planning commission, uh, Mr. Haksar used to, you know, he used to always involve me when uh, he became and uh, when McNamara came, and uh, he annoyed Mr. Haksar because Mr. Haksar felt that he was not because of ideology, but he just felt that McNamara was too much of a corporate type and was philosophically not handling. the problems of uh food self reliance and so on and he kept on asking questions and uh, mr mcnamara said you give the you answer him and then uh, you know he escorted him to the table uh, to his door came back and said oh, the fellow has no uh, philosophical uh, leanings in any case but this is not an ideological stand because Please, uh, I want to give you an answer. Within a couple of months of that, Margaret Thatcher came, and Mr. Haksar. I don't know why, but he used to call me in uh, these discussions. So he called me. I came up from the computer center where I was working on the final version of this five-year plan, and uh, you know, and uh, she asked me a few silly questions, and he. Escorted her to the table, and he said, "Isn't she a doll, Yogin? That it wasn't. It was the fact that she was cultured. She spoke of India's problems in a cultured manner, and Mr. Haksar was extremely uh, set up by those kinds of things. So, uh, in a way, India played a role. It was a role." Which accepted uh, and then towards the beginning of this century uh, we get involved in other discussions i had a good fortune i don't know why he did it but the chap called jim basidi who manufactured the blackberry he set up an international think tank it's called waterloo which is uh, not very far off from toronto and uh, i don't know where they heard of me but they asked me to be a trustee and a founder fellow there and uh, all martin finance minister my late lord prime minister uh, in one of the meetings told me you can there can you write up what you are saying 
as to what the kind of pressure that you get, uh, you will uh, India will be willing to negotiate. So I said, sure, I'll do it. Up. He said, no, but then uh, when will you come to Waterloo? I said, no, I would like to do it from India. He said, no, you'll never. Your question like you will never be able to attend. So I did go to Waterloo. And I was written by John English, who was the elder Trudeau's biographer and minister in Canada and, uh, and Cooper, and a New, Zealand, a New Zealander of Indian origin. And they, I wrote a book, cheek, tongue in cheek. The chapter that I wrote was called on Sherpas and Coolies. And I, you know, because the whole discussion was on Sherpas. So I said, we are coolies, and our concern is food, self-reliance, water, and sustainable development. And it's only then that we will be willing to join the G7 and negotiate. And uh, we were then invited to be a permanent invitee to the G7. India, in those days, was not very enthusiastic. I uh, requested. Uh, Dr. Shah, who was the Prime Minister then, incidentally, like me, I hope you will all, after this meeting, go away from the hotel. We hope that he recovers from uh, the fever that he has in the COVID and is out of the AIMS with a long life he helps us. Is advice. Now, uh, um, so we then uh, developed this the the uh, the, uh, the clause that India will negotiate with the, with the G7 if our interests are taken into account, and so we are now permanent invitees. The G7, and uh, recently, uh, the European Union's Institute of uh, Policy Studies, Strategic Studies at Paris, has uh, covered the last 10 years, and they feel that uh, that's about five years ago, and they feel that India played a major role in those negotiations. Um, I think we have unfortunately stopped planning. And that by itself is in my mind a mistake because what it means is that we don't take a long-term perspective on some of these issues and uh, that then uh, uh, creates problems for us. Uh, we, uh, we are now we abolished the planning commission, but the point is that on these negotiations, whether it is on climate change, whether it is on food self reliance, uh, whether it is on global trade negotiations, if you don't have a long term perspective and interconnections, there are problems that you are going to face. Dutta in his book has the last chapter where he sounds very despondent on all this. I, on the other hand, have a belief that some concept of long term planning is going to come back. We can't do without it. Again, Uh, you'll be working only for the interest of the public sector. I don't think that's a good word. Uh, the pandemic goes back to, you know, again, these, uh, I was telling you about this uh, Canadian work. One of the persons who worked there was Anna Marie Slaughter. Who was
models. Uh, shows that uh, uh, nuclear bombs are not not going to nuclear wars not going to take place, but it's going to be viruses. Now she thought that the virus would come from the pandemic would come from Africa. In fact, it would come from China. And uh, we really don't seem to have an answer. So I really don't know. I mean, have we? For a question, maybe some of you might like. There is a Harvard economist of Hungary, Jurish Rosha, and he has written on the law of entropy, which is that you have fixed this, and if you use them beyond pressure, then uh, you may end up in disaster. It's like the, our ancient concept of life. So there are questions, I hope. You will make suggestions that prolab becomes impossible. With that, I think I will stop my speech and hand over to Vorasa. I am very optimistic of India's welfare, and I'm sure we have the wherewithal to be invite all of you give us to face these problems as come to very short time in the day. And I'm sure in the next two or three decades, my dream is that she will go to college because it's only if she goes to college that the last child will come early and the first child will come late and you really get the demographic dividend. So that into that land, as the great poet said, that's my waste. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Alec. Uh, Kalash, are you there? Yes, sir. Uh, Kalash, sir, are you there? Uh, yeah, 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 yes, sir. Actually, yes. Yeah. Are there any questions? Yes, sir. There are a few questions, sir. There is yeah, a, a, a Dr. S. K. Pachauri. He has uh, asked several short questions. The sum and substance of all his questions is. That the guest has, uh, you know, enlightened us about the past history, uh, but uh, we would like to know from him as to what is the path forward. He would like to know the path. Well, path Pachauri himself, Pachauri himself is one of the few people who takes the past into account in giving advice for international trade negotiations and for environment and science and technology. And uh, I don't want to give another speech, but I think somebody out there listens to him. The RIS is an important institution. It's right in Delhi. And I hope uh, he gets it the kind which shows up in our global negotiations. So the next question is uh, from uh, uh, from uh, Mr. Larji Verma. His question is: It is not relating to economics, etc. It is uh, totally on a different uh, issue. Uh, India adopted West Westminster system of governance. Was it most suited, or should India have given it was given its vast size gone for a presidential system? Um, I think we modified. Like everything else, we are a country which, you know, which, which is willing to get ideas, but by the time they come here, we twist them in a way such that become very, they become very Indian ideas. I think to say that Indian democracy is a best minister model is, uh, is not quite correct. And... Uh, the constitution has been amended a number of times, uh, but uh, basically a federal setup has shown itself to be, uh, and a flexible setup has shown itself to work. And uh, an attempt at pushing unitary forms of government, which some people try to do, is, doesn't lead to strength. In fact, 
that kind of is very brittle and breaks very quickly and those who are willing to bend are able to adjust so the elephant moves slowly but it moves well we criticize it why did neruchas have built up all these uh, national research institutes and teaching institutes but then we talk about our software strength which come because we built up the kinds of skills with which this became possible uh, so in the long run i think we are slower than the tiger economies but we are sure and we do well this my feeling but it's one of those questions since you know question there is a history though a uh, a uh, kind of coincidence that in the fifth of the sixth decade of independence many countries tended to lose their democratic constitutions this happened in france it happened in germany uh, i hope it doesn't happen in india but uh, then again it comes back so decades is not that long a period in the nation's history particularly one which has survived two millenniums uh so the next question is uh, from uh, mr p changal reddy from hyderabad his question is what institutional changes you suggest to make farming globally competitive well i wrote a book on that i said there are three laws one is keep up a high savings rate the other is improve the productivity of resource use what economists call factor productivity and the third is keep an open economy in fact the second and the third are related to each other because if you trade then that leads to competitiveness and that leads to technology adoption so if you do these things uh you will do well if not you will be in the dustbin of history i think india stands a chance of being a globally dominant power in the next 3 to 4 decades if it plays its cards well not if it does it on the basis of religion or something like that right but it might well be the first society which shows that people of different religions different ethnic origins can get together and create a great future so that is our destiny shall we achieve it so, uh, i don't know i am not an astrologer i can only say if you do this we will if you don't we won't like the law of entropy uh, sir dr pachauri has uh, penned another question very short question uh, his question is what have you to say about the repeat of uh, migrant crisis in uh, 2021 it's a very sad story uh, somebody in the government of india really goof they uh, we knew that they were being sent home and then they were blocked and the inhumanity of that you know, this also happens if you don't have a strong federal structure with such problems don't go up to the top with the urgency that is required meant that just too many people died but ultimately there were too many of them they went back to their villages pachauri i hope ras will do some work on that because he has the kind of capabilities to organize groups on that uh, 
I think some of them, at least I've been in some of the villages that I know of, uh, they're returning back. They brought skills with which they were able to do something good. But we didn't really do it on an organized basis. I think if they were, Eto, we should have facilitated their going back. If we were going to give them the sack. Second, we should have even used Madrika to ask them to start doing good things in the village. Because migration is in a sense double blessed. When the migrant comes back, he or she also brings in new attitudes. I think, so, uh, I think we didn't take full but I do hope we will now. Uh, sir, more and more questions are pouring in, uh, but uh, the, given the time available, uh, if you permit, we can take uh, three more questions. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, sir, the next question is from Mr. B. N. Dalmia from New Delhi. Uh, his question has got two parts. Number one is, what is the economy? What is the economy not the most crucial priority for our governments? Why is, the, why is the economy not the most crucial priority for the government? Barring Narsimha Rao government and UPA, one, none of our governments have given economy overriding priority. His second question is, second part of the question is, given the time and money we waste on perennial elections, would it not be economically wise to have simultaneous elections? Um, I, you know, these are questions you need to do. But uh, I think uh, basically, uh, what well, to share, the pandemic means that we have to put in a lot of resources into um, fighting it. In fact, I think the problem is that we are not putting it enough resources. Uh, I mean, I would have certainly imposed a 10 percent tax for the corporate sector so that we can, you know, increase, uh, we, so that there is enough of oxygen and so on. And lesser people die, we losing too many people. Ask me, if you have the right now, is a priority that we have in China. Is doing very well in vaccine. The states are doing it. But we need resources for more crematoriums. So that the sadness when one dies. So, right now, I do think that is what will happen in the future. The first thing is to fight the pandemic. I love to answer questions. But it has to have a sense of priorities because economics is really about welfare and this is that and this is also so the pandemic has to be that would be my broad answer. But then uh, once it's over, uh, my general answer is we need to plan the recovery in a much better manner. And that is where abolishing planning I think, it makes us do things in a way. So the next question is from uh, Dr. Uh, Sangeeta Kaul. Her question is a very short one. How do you envisage India at 100? How do you envisage India at 100? Sorry, how do you do? How do you envisage? How do you see India, India at 100? Has? At 100, 100 years. You have spoken at 75 years. Ah, so that's a lot. Like, yeah. I see India, as I said, I'm not a, I am an economist. I think if we save, if we send a girl to college, I think if we trade, I think if we keep our culture together, we keep our peoples together, I see the India as a dominant economic power. But I also see India as the first society in human history which has shown how people of different religions can get together and build a culture. 
which is of its own, which is what will happen when India is a hundred. Uh, I hope to be around when India is a. I hope to be around. When India is a <laughs> so, so I hope my some of my predictions come true in the sense. Sir, so the last question is uh, from uh, Mr. Aparna of Ahmedabad. Her question is, Sir, could you share your insights as to where the Indian policy moving in terms of need to merge development planning with regional and spatial planning? Merger of uh, development planning with Regional and spatial planning. Um, that really needs another webinar. I would Christopher Benninger. You know, I think uh, one of course is to strengthen town and country planning. The other is to recognize that a lot of the action is not in the Delhi-based institutions. But in the spatial planning institutions which are coming up in universities and in town, has a number of them. Hyderabad, my own city of Ahmedabad is called Nirma University. It's got set uh, if we do this kind of planning. Uh, there are a number of corporates in that teams are getting involved in all this. Because they are using some of this special money that they have to build up the areas around uh, the facilities. So there is a lot of action, but there seems to be very little of coordination at upper level. And really, this kind of planning prospers if there is a good interplay between national planning and regional and local planning. I think it's a mistake to have downgraded the planning theory at the district and the Taluka and the Punjab. Uh, uh, the, the things which Jairam and other get started at the bottom in the distribute now. You know, there are all kinds of things. Why is this many uh, waste? I remember we are given one crore to each district for Rajiv people. Prime Minister and uh, my wife once told me jokingly that in one of your districts, the Sarpanch had bought a horse. So I said, you know, maybe he needs a horse. And if he doesn't need a horse, he's going to horse. So same around with Chucky Mike. So, but that kind of faith in local planning then integrates into upper levels of planning is something which is missing these days. I hope we will manage that. We will encourage the streets to plan, the states will encourage local areas to plan. Incidentally, by planning, I don't mean budget kind of planning. I mean strategic visions. I mean using incentives and disincentives for people to do resource allocation in the right way. And give the kind of resources which they do the right thing in terms of non discrimination based on sex us. So I am, uh, sir, I am through with the questions. Yes, I think uh, we can thank Professor Alan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor my email is yalag at gmail.com. So please just send a, an email to me and I will definitely respond. I remain a teacher. Kailash, you want to thank Prasad? Uh, 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 sir, on, uh, on behalf of uh, India Interest Center and on behalf of all the you know persons on the audience who are connected to it, I'd like to thank Professor Alag profusely. Uh, sir, you have given us a real insight of uh, the development of uh, India in the last 75 years. And you have also indicated 
uh, as to what is the best uh, path you know forward for us to which we, towards which we look at look forward uh, i thank you once again sir and looking forward to hearing more and more uh, you know from you in future uh, you know in our programs thank you very much sir thank you thank you thank you thank you sir thank you very thank you sir thank you thank you sir iic is a favorite institution